So welcome. Thank you again. And Tara, thanks for that introduction. Uh, really happy to be here. And uh, thank you to uh, the Summer Learning Academy and to Schools Plus, who've been so instrumental in bringing this issue forward into education. Uh, so like Tara said, we're, we're going to be doing a, a quick overview of commercial sexual exploitation of children and youth in Nova Scotia. So really focusing on the context, complexity, and trying to answer why training matters. So, you know, I was careful to phrase this as a presentation instead of a training, let's say, because we're really covering most of what we would have in our module one. Uh, we currently have four modules that we've developed and more in development that we will talk about. But really, this, this just starts the conversation. This is kind of the foundation. What is commercial sexual exploitation? How is it showing up in Nova Scotia? Who's at risk? Which really will help us answer why training matters. So like Tara said, my name is Thunder Shanti Naruz Van Iktren. You did great, Tara, with that. My name is so long, I know, <laughs> uh, but I go by Thunder. So I'm the Trafficking and Exploitation Services System Coordinator with YWCA Halifax. Uh, we've been doing this work and trying to address this issue for the past four years. And uh, throughout the presentation, I'll give you some more information as to what our response is and a couple of resources that you can also access towards the end. Now, I do want to make a quick note about self-care. Uh, so I know that that's very much a buzzword that gets thrown around, but I do always like to bring it up uh, in this context because what we're talking about is tough. It's heavy. Uh, it's, not, it's not great to hear about what's happening to our children and youth and to think about it uh, and, and start to deal with it. So in terms of your own self-care today, you know, take breaks as you need. Practice some grounding and calming exercises if you need. Uh, we do have a break in the middle. Well, there'll be a half hour break at two o'clock. Uh, so, so that'll be good if you need to go outside, take a quick walk, whatever you need to do. But I do just like to bring that up here that uh, your care and your self-care and all of this are really important as well. So let's dive in. So these are our learning goals today. Uh, really, we're trying to answer why training matters. So really, educators are so key. You are there with the youth, with the children every day, and you are key in identifying, intervening, and disrupting the cycle of commercial sexual exploitation. So this is why training for staff is really essential, because you're so well placed to be able to deal with the issue in some way. And in order to do that, you need to understand the issue, understand the risks, and understand the signs and how to respond. So today we're gonna to be working on a few of these things. So really working to eliminate problem blindness, understanding the complexity of the issue, and start to discuss the importance of intervening early, responding appropriately, and ultimately demystifying what the problem is. So you'll notice as I go through that, at least for the first part, there is a lot of me talking. Uh, this has to do with kind of coming around to the complexity of the issue, we're going to talk about the legalities of it and then how that translates to how the problem is actually showing up, how the issue is showing up in Nova Scotia. But throughout, we do have some videos. We do have some interactive activities as well. So just hang with me for the first part where I am going to be doing a lot of talking uh, and then we'll, we'll come around to some activities as well. So first of all, we can't respond to what we can't see. So there's a really great quote that kind of sums this up in terms of that problem blindness. When we don't see a problem, we can't solve it. And that blindness can create passivity, even in the face of enormous harm. So really, in order to address the issue of commercial sexual exploitation of children and youth, we have to know that it's a problem in the first place. Hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll have a really good idea of what the issue is and an understanding of it. But it's a great way to start, uh, you know, in terms of saying that, yes, this is an issue in Nova Scotia. So let's set that as our foundation, that this is an issue, and we're now going to dive into what exactly is that issue. So first of all, you'll notice that I use this term a lot, commercial sexual exploitation of children and youth, or CSEC for short. Uh, you'll notice sometimes I trip over it, sometimes it comes out nice and easy, but I will use kind of a combination of the full term as well as the, the acronym there. And really, this is about the importance of language. So I do use this term 
very particularly, very specifically. So it was used in the descriptions and any promotional material that went out for this. And there's a reason for that. So this term originated in 1996 at the First World Congress Against Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children, which was held in Stockholm, Sweden. At the time, they issued a declaration for action, which framed the problem as being a form of sexual abuse against children. So this really means that the commercial sexual exploitation of children is any action which treats someone under the age of 18 as a commercial sexual object and any adult who pays for or collects money for the sale of the sexual services of someone under the age of 18 is a perpetrator of CSEC. So really this framing of the issue has a much broader application than the current way that Canada deals with the buying and selling of minors in the commercial sex trade. So there are many forms of exploitation that occur in the commercial sex industry from both a supply and demand perspective. Anytime a person is sold or bought as a product, they are being exploited. But the trafficking in persons charge in the criminal code really only deals with the exploitation that happens on the supply side of the equation. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. So really defining the problem as CSEC instead of simply human trafficking, we might understand and analyze it more holistically rather than just how it's legally framed which is generally as a labor issue, or even simply a problem with pimps. So the next thing to understand is, what are commercial sexual services? So you'll notice throughout that while we are focusing on commercial sexual exploitation, i.e. sexual exploitation and trafficking of children and youth, we do also talk about the sex trade as a whole because they do intersect in a lot of ways. So it's important that we start with this understanding of what are commercial sexual services, what is the sex trade, and then we can go from there. So really, at its heart, commercial sexual services are any exchange of sexual services for money, material items, or lifestyle. There are various types of commercial sexual services, which we'll talk about in the next slide. So really, this is a global, this is a global issue. The sex trade is global, it's a billion dollar industry, and it operates on the principles of capitalism. So it occurs legally and illegally to varying degrees in different jurisdictions, depending on the laws of that place and also uh, the, some of the unique ways that it might show up. For example, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this in terms of how it's showing up in Nova Scotia, which might be different than how it's showing up elsewhere in Canada. So not all commercial sexual services involve sexual intercourse. There's this idea that when we're talking about the sex trade, we're talking about sex for money. And while that is one of the ways that it occurs, there are other ways that people participate. And so when we talk about the types of commercial sexual services, hopefully that'll give you a better idea of how broad this can be. Also really important to note that not all commercial sexual services are exploitative. So it doesn't necessarily mean that by someone participating in the sex trade that they are being exploited or they're having a violent or traumatic experience. Many women around the world have economically survived and some have thrived in the commercial sex industry, whether they are autonomous or whether they're managed, let's say working in an escort agency. The issue is that the presence of a normalized adult sex industry does make the issue of commercial sexual exploitation of children and youth harder to see, harder to understand, and harder to respond to. Abolition of the industry as a whole would threaten an already marginalized population further underground and legalization would likely push the supply and demand for children and youth further underground. So like I said, exploitation in the sex trade happens when people are treated like products or objects and specifically what we're talking about today when those providing the services are under the age of 18 years. Now, when we're talking about trafficking specifically, this happens when those providing the services are controlled by a third party and then exploited for their labor. So we'll, we'll talk more about specifically under the law what exploitation is and what trafficking are. Uh, and hopefully that will also broaden your understanding of what all those different terms mean if you're not sure yet. So first of all, like I said, there are various types of commercial sexual services. 
So really there is this misconception that it's just sex for money. And that is a way that people participate. This could be called physical sex or under our laws, the word is prostitution. Now keep in mind that this could also be other sexual acts. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's intercourse, but it is the, the exchange of sexual acts for money, maybe for drugs, could be for rent, for food, for cigarettes, really anything. Anything that has material value can be potentially exchanged for sexual acts. So most people, when they think of the sex trade, they, they might think of this. They think of the word prostitution. They think of physical sex. But like you see listed here, there are a lot of other ways that folks participate. So for example, there's pornography. So this is either the amateur or the professional production of sexual acts. Escorting. This is intimate companionship or accompaniment. So what's happening here is that the purchaser is paying for someone's time and the other person is providing companionship, accompaniment, could be the girlfriend experience or the porn star experience. And really it's this exchange uh, of some sort of material value for the person's time. And sex can be part of the deal, but really it's also about companionship and accompaniment. Could be BDSM services that someone is providing. So if you're not sure what BDSM stands for, it's bondage, discipline, dominance, submission, and sadism, masochism, sorry. So really this, these are folks who would identify maybe as dominatrix, uh, and they're providing, par providing certain kink services, which could include hum humiliation, uh, any sort of bondage, uh, dominance, they might be hurting the other person. And these are things that uh, folks find sexually gratifying. There's dancing or stripping. So this could be in a club or privately. So uh, most of us are familiar with strip clubs, but this could also happen at a bachelor or a bachelorette party, or just hiring someone for a birthday party or coming into a home or hotel uh, and dancing for folks. Camming is performing live on webcam. So really this could include any type of sexual act that's happening over camera. So dancing, stripping, performing sex, uh, any sort of fantasy that someone might have, uh, if it's happening on a platform, let's say, so on a uh, quote unquote legitimate platform, someone would pay and then the, the dancer or the stripper or the actor could uh, go into a private room with someone and act out what their fantasies might be and have that interaction. So it's not in person, it's over camera. And something important to note is that especially with this type of participation in the sex trade, we're really seeing this increase, I have seen it increase during the pandemic. So with folks being at home, quarantined, isolated, the sex trade pivoted so quickly. When strip clubs were closed down, we heard from one of our partners in New York, uh, who's been working with victims and survivors for decades. They said that within a week, a strip club on Instagram had popped up. So really, the sex trade is so quick to respond to what's happening in the, the outside world, let's say. And this is certainly something that's really been increasing. And online recruitment for children and youth has increased a lot, as well as their participation in some sort of uh, capacity in the sex trade online, whether that's through a third party controlling them or whether they are uh, seemingly making that choice to do so. We also have massage parlors. So if you're familiar with what would be called happy ending massages or nude or erotic massages and sugaring. So this is a commercial relationship between a sugar daddy or a sugar mama and their sugar baby. So really what's happening is that one person, the sugar daddy or mama, is paying for the other person's lifestyle. So this could be that they're paying for their basic needs, they're paying for their apartment, their food, their clothes, etc. But also could be uh, high luxury items as well. So sex and companionship are part of the deal. So it is this transactional type of relationship. And it's tricky because this is quite popular in college and university circles. So generally, we are talking about folks who are 18 years or older who are participating in this sense. Uh, but it is a type of commercial sexual service uh, and what we would consider participation in the sex trade as well. So now we move into the actual legalities of all of these types of sexual services. So really, technically, we could probably say for all of these that 
it depends. Uh, in terms of working with, uh, with some folks in our test partnership, the Traffic and Exploitation Services System Partnership, a lot of these things really depend. It depends on the age of the person. It depends on how they're selling it. It depends on who's advertising, et cetera. But this kind of breaks it down a little bit uh, to help your understanding of how this all fits into the law. So really important to note here that when we are talking about the legalities of it in terms of someone to sell sexual services, they do need to be 18 years or older. So we're not talking about children and youth in this capacity. We're just talking about uh, how the sex trade is to varying degrees legal and illegal in Canada. So it is safe to say that it's legal for an individual to sell any commercial sexual services in Canada insofar as the criminal code violations pertaining to the commodification of sex remove criminal liability from the individual advertising and selling their services independently. However, it is illegal for most services to be bought. So as you see in the graphic here, for most of it, it is legal to sell, but in many cases it's illegal to buy. So the reason for it depends, as you see here on the porn, is that the production, distribution, and possession of porn might be illegal if it's considered obscene. So a dominant characteristic of that is the undue exploitation of sex or of sex that includes crime, horror, cruelty, and violence. And of course, we're also talking about child pornography in this case as being illegal. Now, that's what it's called under the law. Uh, those terms itself don't really capture the issue very well, but that is what it's called under the law. So that's where someone involved is under the 18, under 18, or if they're pretending to be under 18. So we do have a legal sex industry in Canada. So these are registered businesses that offer sexual services through a legitimate business. So it could be a strip club or an adult entertainment company, for example. But Hiring strippers, for example, if it's not done through a business, if it's done privately, could potentially be illegal. So it's also apparently legal for strip club owners to materially benefit from selling the strip club experience, as well as for third party producers or distributors of adult pornography. Now moving on to escort services as an example, they can be operating legal businesses as well, but depending on how they operate, they might be criminally liable if their services include transactional sexual services. Now, really important to note, and this is happening this year. So in February 2020, an Ontario judge ruled in favor of the owners of uh, an escort agency called Fantasy World Escorts. They had been charged with the third party material benefit and advertising laws. And so really, this, was, this has been the first legal test of the reformed prostitution laws, which happened in 2015. So it's unknown right now if this ruling is going to affect the criminal code. Uh, it depends on whether or not the decision is appealed and if it moves up through the courts. However, a legal precedent has now been set. And so it's very likely that the prostitution laws will be challenged again, as they were in 2007. So what something important to know here as well is that we don't know about the status of sugaring. So like I said, as it usually involves people over the age of 18 and is really not the straightforward transaction, which some of these other commercial sexual services are, it is likely legal. But as far as we know, no sugaring case has gone before the courts. So we are looking into this and trying to figure out uh, what what the status of it is. But this hopefully gives you a picture of even when we're just talking about the legalities of folks 18 or over involved in the sex trade, how complex it is. Now the next three slides deal with the criminal code side of things. So in terms of this complexity, one of the ways that we can deal with the issue is the criminal justice system. But there are, there are various types of criminal code violations uh, that deal with various things involved in the issue. So the primary tool of the federal government is to tackle, to tackle this issue is the criminal justice system and using the trafficking in persons charge to combat it. So this was introduced to the criminal code in 2005. Now I'm going to read off the actual definition of it. So it's a little bit long, but just to kind of give you an idea of what is trafficking when we're talking specifically about the criminal code. 
So this is every person who recruits, transports, transfers, receives, holds, conceals, or harbors a person, or exercises control, direction, or influence over the movements of a person for the purpose of exploiting them or facilitating their exploitation is guilty of an indictable offense. So that kind of gives you an idea of what the trafficking charge is. And you'll see that there's then various other pieces to it, uh, having to do with the age of the person, getting money or other benefits, specifically dealing with taking or destroying ID of someone being trafficked. Now you'll notice here that there's also exploitation under the trafficking in persons charge. So the specific definition of exploitation for human trafficking is really approached as a labor issue. So I'll read this one again to give you an idea of what it says. Causing someone to provide or offer to provide labor or a service by engaging in conduct that could reasonably be expected to cause that person to believe that their safety or the safety of a person they know would be threatened if they failed to do so. So it's interesting that in this case, it's phrased more as a labor issue, whereas actual sexual exploitation is under a different type of criminal code offense. So trafficking has been included in the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act since 2002 and deals specifically with the trafficking of people across international borders. However, when people are criminally charged for human trafficking, whether in a labor context or a sexual labor context, it is the same piece of legislation that deals with both. So in this way, the criminal code does not really make a distinction between the types of trauma that can occur with CSEC and doesn't address it as an issue of child sexual abuse. So if you think back to uh, us as YWCA Halifax and our partnership being very careful about our language and phrasing it as CSEC, commercial sexual exploitation of children and youth, it's because we are trying to reframe it as an issue of child sexual abuse. So in our criminal code, it's not dealt with in the same way. Next, we have sexual offenses. So trafficking in persons is not the only section of the criminal code that does deal with the commercial sex industry. There are a number of other criminal code violations that are often laid in combination with trafficking charges. So you'll see here that the first bundle have to do with assault, sexual assault, and then what are called sexual offenses against children. So in here at 153 there, you do see that there is sexual exploitation under sexual offenses. So I'll read this one again for you. This is every person commits an offense who is in a position of trust or authority towards a young person who is a person with whom the young person is in a relationship of dependency or who is in a relationship with a young person that is exploitative of the young person and who for a sexual purpose touches directly or indirectly with a part of the body or with an object, any part of the body of the young person for sexual purposes, invites, counsels, or incites a young person to touch directly or indirectly with a part of the body or with an object, the body of any person, including the body of the person who so invites, counsels, or incites, and the body of the young person. Clear like mud? <laughs> That's a lot, right? Even just looking at our criminal code, this is very complex. And keeping in mind that any of these offenses can happen outside of the context of the sex trade. So it doesn't require the sale of sexual services or for money to be exchanged. It can be applied if any adult is in a position of trust or power or authority who gets sexually involved with a minor, or if a minor is in a dependent relationship with an adult and becomes sexually involved with them. The last set of laws that we're looking at are the prostitution laws. And I do wanna say in quotes, prostitution. So these are the 286s as they're known on the street. They were reformed in 2014 with the introduction of the of Bill C-36, and they're all contained in Section 286 of the Criminal Code. So generally, when we talk about language, we, we do try to refrain from using the word prostitute or prostitution, and we have an activity coming up that hopefully you can help uh, answer why that might be. Uh, but just so you know, the reform to these laws came after a long court battle that was initiated in 2007. So there were three Ontario sex workers 
who asked the court to strike down the three provisions of the criminal code because they violated sex workers' constitutional right to security of the person. So the Supreme Court gave the government an opportunity to reform the laws before they were taken off the books completely. And at the 11th hour, the Harper government passed and ascended Bill C-36, which means that we were uh, essentially adopting what's called the Nordic model at that time. So there, there are several laws that apply here. There's purchasing laws. So this is where it's illegal to obtain sexual services or communication for the purchase of. Advertising laws, illegal to advertise the sexual services of someone else. Procuring laws, illegal to persuade or ask someone for sexual services. And material benefit, illegal to receive financial or other material benefit from the sale of sexual services. But now, after these reforms, sex workers are protected from criminal liability for any and all of these activities. So as you can see, even when we're just talking about the criminal code side of things, this is complicated and it's complex. And we've only just talked about this one piece of it so far. So moving on to the history of the sex trade in Nova Scotia. And really the reason that we include this here is that in order to understand where we are today, we need to understand where we've come from and how we've gotten to this place. So really, the commercial sex trade is a feature of Halifax's history. As a port city that hosted sailors and servicemen from around the world, our commercial sex industry has been really well known globally. So it's become so normalized in our culture. There's actually a 2002 National Film Board documentary, uh, it's called The Canadians, and it featured a woman named Ada McCallum. Now, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with Ada McCallum, but in the documentary, she was really celebrated as a female entrepreneur, and I use quotes again, uh, who ran a number of brothels in the city from the 1960s to the 1980s and provided seemingly a never ending supply of girls and women to Halifax's power brokers, sailors, tradesmen. Ada actually eventually did go to prison, but it was for tax evasion, uh, not for anything having to do necessarily with the brothels that she operated. And her adopted son took over what was the family business until it was eventually shut down in the 1990s. It's really interesting to watch that documentary because in some of our other training modules, when we talk about perpetrator tactics and pimp tactics, a lot of what they were describing and how Ada McCallum dealt with what were called her girls was very much pimp type behavior. So it's interesting that there's this National Film Board documentary that's celebrating, whereas the reality underneath the surface is quite different. Now in 1992, there was a bust of a nationwide pimping ring that involved many teenage girls from Nova Scotia. This really brought the issue to light at that time. Of course, the issue goes back much further than 1992, right? But up until that historical bust, the cultural acceptance, normalization, and even romanticism of the commercial sex industry was reflected in the presence of an active and lucrative trade in the city. A week after the 1992 bust, Halifax Police and RCMP struck a joint task force, which was known as uh, on juvenile prostitution. And three years after that bust, the criminal code then introduced the new trafficking in person charges. So you might be interested to know that there's actually no legal sex trade to speak of in Nova Scotia. As an example, the last strip club, Ralph's Place, uh, it was in Dartmouth. It closed in January of 2018 and really has been essentially bylawed out of existence. So the commercial sex trade is, of course, still thriving here, but it's really all happening underground or virtually happening underground now. So there are some unique features of the commercial sex trade in Nova Scotia. So like I said, you know, it looks different in different jurisdictions ha having to do with the laws. It looks different internationally and it looks different in different provinces. So among law enforcement circles, Nova Scotia has been known as a source location for C-Sec victims for many years. Uh, in our work with police officers uh, at the Halifax Regional Police and RCMP, there was one police officer who recalled attending a conference on the issue and being approached by others who were there who were really curious as to why so many victims were coming from Nova Scotia. So there's actually no currently published research or quantitative data that's really known about this, but anecdotal evidence from service providers nationwide 
indicate that many of the victims that they're working with are originally from Nova Scotia. So this is such a unique feature for Nova Scotia in that it's largely export driven. So if you think about it, for example, since we have no legal strip clubs here, the closest place to strip is in Moncton. So in that case, victims would be transported across the border to do so, which would then fall under that trafficking in persons type charge under the criminal code. Another difference is that in Sydney, so when we're talking about Cape Breton, it's reported that the majority of people who are engaged in the commercial sex industry are independent or survival sex workers and overwhelmingly Indigenous women and girls. There is a known stroll in Dartmouth as well. So the stroll being uh, where folks are out on the street advertising their sexual services. So there is a known stroll in Dartmouth. However, the issue does seem to be more street level in Sydney than it is in HRM where it's happening more behind closed doors. Now, there is little known about the commercial sex industry in rural Nova Scotia, but what is known is that there is an increasing number of children and youth who are identified as engaging in it, both under the control of a third party and independently or uh, originating from rural communities. So what we've seen is that there have been cases reported all across Nova Scotia, Halifax, Sydney, Yarmouth, Truro, New Glasgow, etc. So if there's this misconception that this is just happening in urban HRM, that's not quite true. This is an urban and rural issue. We do see the issue showing up in the child protection system as well. And the Department of Community Services has prioritized it as an issue internally and has made a number of systemic investments and changes to address the issue with specialized training, programming and services. It's also anecdotally reported that CSEC disproportionately affects youth from the African Nova Scotian and Indigenous communities. Now, because police don't collect data on the racial identi identities of perpetrators or victims, it really makes it extremely difficult to get a fulsome understanding of how disproportionately these communities are affected. And more work does need to be done in engaging the African Nova Scotian and Indigenous communities so that their unique experiences are not left out of the conversation and planning. When we talk a little bit about our test partnership and how we're responding to that and the creation of specifically African Nova Scotian, Indigenous and 2S LGBTQ cultural advisories is one of the ways that we're trying to respond to that issue and that we're uplifting those voices, we're listening to them and we're responding in ways that are appropriate for the various communities. Another thing to note is that little is known about the experience of boys and trans folks engaged. So you'll notice throughout the presentation that I, I try to use folks generally because it encompasses everyone, uh, it's gender neutral. Uh, but when we talk about police reported statistics in a second, uh, overwhelmingly the, the victims that have been reported in police stats are young girls, so are female. But even though this isn't showing up in the criminal justice system, we do know that CSEC is an issue in our 2S LGBTQ communities. So Halifax specifically, for example, there's an unspoken but known instances of young boys on Citadel Hill after dark providing sexual services to the Halifax uh, gay community. So there was one well-known advocate for the community who remarked in a closed community meeting on the topic that the gay community has not yet come to terms with the sexual abuse and exploitation of boys that has been present for decades. Further, our advisory group, uh, the Queer and Trans Advisory Group, 2S LGBTQ+, for the TESS partnership, has raised concerns around the exploitation that occurs among trans folk in Nova Scotia, which largely happens due to the community being marginalized from mainstream sources of financial security and opportunity. We'll talk more about that when we look at a spectrum of choice and how this all kind of translates to how it's happening on the ground and what uh, victims and survivors experience is. So now that we've looked at some of these legalities around the issue and a bit of how it's showing up in Nova Scotia, these are just some stats to draw your attention to the issue. If you're like me and you like numbers, this can be helpful. But police and court reported stats really don't give us a fulsome understanding of the prevalence of the problem. So they are flawed. They're helpful, but they're flawed. <laughs> so there's a few reasons. So human trafficking is often hidden and it involves people who don't identify as victims or who don't recognize their experience as quote unquote being trafficked. Victims are often highly vulnerable 
and are fearful or distrustful of authorities and won't come forward at all. They're generally economically dependent on or fearful of their perpetrators. So all of these things contribute to the underreporting of these crimes. So these are really incomplete statistics. They help give us a part of the picture, but they are incomplete. So it can give us some insights, at least in terms of the victims that are coming into contact with the criminal justice system. So you might have seen this reported in the news a few months ago. Nova Scotia does have the highest rate of human trafficking in the country. Now note this rate is in terms, uh, this is a rate, sorry, and it's not in terms of raw numbers. So for example, one in every 100,000 people in Nova Scotia compared to 0.5 in every 100,000 people across Canada. The next highest was Ontario, which had a rate of 0.9. So to give you an idea, Nova Scotia holds 3% of the national population, but we hold 6% of all national human trafficking incidents. So here you see that we do have some stats around the victims as well. So like I said, uh, this is coming from some stats between 2009 and 2018. So these are reported nationally. 97% of victims were women or girls and 28% were under the age of 18. Of all the human trafficking incidents or complaints that have gone through the criminal justice system, 47% did not identify a perpetrator, but where a perpetrator was identified, 81% of them were men. So in our training, we do go into more depth into that gender division as well and how that all plays into it. 92% of their victims knew their perpetrator and 29% of victims were trafficked by a current or former partner. So again, this gives us an idea of what it's looking like and at least how it's showing up in the criminal justice system. Looks a little bit of that gender bias, who are the victims, who are the perpetrators, and how it's showing up, how people are ending up participating in the sex trade. So after all that, how do we tell? How do we tell if it's trafficking? Is it exploitation? Is it sex work? So really the language that we use is so important just like any other complex social justice issue. Many service providers can be afraid of saying the wrong thing, right? We all wanna be progressive. We wanna label it correctly. We wanna talk about it appropriately. So if we don't know how to label what we're seeing or suspecting that we might be seeing, then we can be ineffective, providing support, providing the wrong support, or imposing support onto someone. So the first thing you need to know that's really important is that no one under the age of 18 can legally give consent to participate in sex work. So really it would be inappropriate to call someone under 18 a sex worker, even if they call themselves that. The sexual exploitation laws remove any expression of consent that they might, uh, that they give to participate. So if they're 18 or older though, they are free to independently sell their own sexual services if they choose to, like we saw in the various laws and how that kind of plays out. So even the word choice is really tricky, right? Choice is not cut and dry. And even including the word choice in these trainings, we often get feedback around that and saying that even the use of choice is problematic or it's difficult to, to wrap your head around it. How does someone choose to be involved in the sex trade? And when they're being trafficked or exploited and there's a seeming choice or they're saying they're choosing, how does that play out? So this is what we have developed through our test partnership is something that we call a spectrum of choice. So, so this is really helpful to kind of tease apart all of these different things that we've just been talking about and how this then shows up for folks who are participating. So really, choice is not a binary yes or no thing, right? Yes, today I'm going to be involved in the sex trade. Nope, tomorrow I'm not going to do that. It doesn't really work like that, even if we're thinking of going to the gym, right? There's a lot of factors to, to think about. It's like, how far away is it? Do I have time? Do I have my running shoes? What about all these COVID precautions, etc.? cetera? There's, there's a lot that happens when we're talking about choice. And they really depend on the opportunities we have and the external pressures that might be guiding those choices. We might change our minds. A choice can go between yes or no, no to yes, really given on what circumstances are surrounding it. 
So choice is a big theme when we're talking about narratives of trafficking, exploitation and sex work. And it really matters a lot, particularly when it comes to the prosecution of any of these criminal charges. So like I said, we've developed this spectrum of choice to, to better understand how choice comes into play in the sex trade and helps us make the distinction between trafficking, exploitation and sex work. So what you'll see here on this graphic is on the left hand side. So there are kind of six categories. So on the left hand side, we are talking about trafficking and exploitation or generally all controlled by a third party perpetrator. And on the right hand side, this is where it intersects with sex work. So this may or may not be exploitative as well, depending on the situation. So, for example, starting at the no choice category. So, like I said, this is third party controlled. So there's a perpetrator, there's a pimp involved, someone who's controlling someone else. In this case, this is where we might see someone who's been kidnapped, forced, confined, who might have been trunked or gagged, uh, taken away. This can be considered modern day slavery, if you've ever heard of it referred to in that sense. This is often how trafficking is portrayed, is in this really no choice category. So this is where you'll see the, the movie Taken would kind of fall into that. Uh, if you think of some of the images that might be going around with someone in chains, uh, someone, you know, chained up in a basement somewhere. That's kind of how we see it in mainstream culture is very much in this no choice. But there are other ways that it's showing up. So, for example, we move into coerced choice. So this can be someone that's been deceived into participation. Maybe it's false advertising. They've been threatened, threatens, uh, threats to themselves, their family, their pets, their community. Maybe they've been blackmailed or sex torted. So someone's holding something over their head and in that way forcing them into participation in the sex trade. This is sexual exploitation and can also fit the trafficking profile. As we move on into perceived choice, if you also see this as a bell curve, so like I said, you know, no choice is really how it's presented in the media and in mainstream, and we think that that's mostly how it's showing up. But in fact, with the bell curve, in terms of people's participation, it's more happening in the middle. So at least in how this is showing up in Nova Scotia. So in the perceived choice, this is where someone has been manipulated into participating. There's often a romantic involvement. So this means that their perpetrator has inserted themselves as their boyfriend, as their partner, as their girlfriend. And really the person thinks that they're making this choice. There's some sort of economic dependency. So they're doing it to support their family, support their daddy. They love this person. They're saying, yes, I wanna participate. I'm doing this because I love my boyfriend and he's asking me to do it. So this is sexual exploitation. It can be trafficking. But it's quite tricky because, like I said, in this case, the victim thinks that they're making a choice. So it's perceived. They're doing this for a reason. There's been these trauma bonds that they have uh, built up with their perpetrator. And so they might not identify as a victim. As we move on to the right hand side, like I said, this is where it kind of intersects with uh, the sex, uh, sorry, sex work. So this is where we might see situational choice. So in this case, it, there could be a third party involved. Uh, it may not be third party controlled, but there, there could be some codependency happening. So whether that's codependency on a partner, on drugs, if there's addictions present, uh, and certainly if there's lack of access to opportunity. So in this case, it can be exploitative, depending, and what you would often hear as survival sex work. So we have a partner out in Winnipeg that uses this uh, analogy, which I like. So it's choice, but it's choice from the world's shittiest buffet. So really, yes, there's a choice, but what choice is it? This is just in terms of surviving that someone is engaging in the sex trade. When we move into apparent choice and evident choice, this is more independent. So these are where folks might identify as sex workers. They've made an educated decision to participate. But specifically in the apparent choice, there still might be a lack of access to other opportunities and there is an economic dependency. So like I said, this, this one is actually pretty new. Uh, this came out of our work with our advisory group, the 2S LGBTQ advisory group. And what they brought up is that when they looked at the spectrum of choice, they said it didn't really capture the experience, the specific experience of trans folk who were engaged. So when we're looking at that lack of access to other opportunities and we're talking about the stigma that still exists, and so folks are making this choice and it, they are independently choosing to do so, but really it might be because they don't have a lot of access to other opportunities. 
And then when we move to the end in terms of evident choice, so like I said, they're making an independent, educated decision to participate. These folks do have access to opportunities. There's a, there's a sense of privilege here. It's often autonomous. They're using online platforms. They have access to um, different clientele. They can make choices as to what calls they accept, what calls they don't accept, et cetera. So really they're making an empowered choice. They're choosing working in the sex trade as a career. So this kind of gives you an idea of, again, how this is showing up and where choice plays in. But we're going to add one more layer of complexity here. Consent and choice are two very different things. So what we're talking about in this slide is specifically around the laws of consent. So this is referring to sexual activity under our laws. And it is defined quite broadly. So it could be kissing to fondling to sexual intercourse. So when we're talking about consent, we're talking about sexual activity in general. So you'll see a bunch of different ages that we've listed here. And so even in looking at the consent laws, it can be quite complex. So the first thing to remember is that if someone is under 12 years old, this means that they're 11 or under, they cannot consent to sexual activity with anyone, period. That's actually kind of the easier one, if you could say that. No consent, meaning that they cannot choose sexual activity with anyone. Now, our consent laws in Canada, technically the age of consent is 16, but there are pieces in it that are, there are some close in age exceptions. So for example, a 12 or 13 year old cannot consent to sexual activity if their partner is over 14 or 15, or if they're in a position of power, authority, or dependency. So yes, if we look at how that translates to choice, 12 and 13 year, sorry, 12 and 13 year olds can choose to, uh, to sexual activity if the person is less than two years older than them. So there's this close in age exception. There are also close in age exceptions when it comes to 14 and 15 year olds. In this case, it has to do with five years. So there is no consent. They cannot give consent if the partner is over 19 or 20, or again, in a position of power, authority, or dependency but they can choose sexual activity if the person is less than five years older than them. And it does have to do with the very specific birth dates of folks. So if this were to go before the court, looking at people's birth dates to kind of determine that age difference. Now, when we move into 16 and 17, like I said, 16 is technically the age of consent in Canada. So they can choose sexual activity with no age exceptions. So 16 year olds can choose to have sex with someone who's 35, 40, et cetera. There can be a quite a large age difference and technically under our laws, a 16 year old can consent, but they cannot consent if the person is in a position of power, authority or dependency. So that's where there's that piece as well, that anyone under the age of 18, regardless of the age difference, cannot consent if the person is in a position of power, authority or dependency. Then when you move to 18 years old, this is where there's this blanket, uh, blanket statement that they can consent to sexual partners. There's no exceptions, um, at least when we're talking about that power, authority, etc. And they can choose sexual activity with no exceptions. So then the question is really, how do we then determine if this, this is an exploitative relationship? So these are some questions that can help to kind of tease it apart. So first of all, how old is the child or youth? So this will help us determine, let's say if they're 11, right? We know that no consent can be given. There is no possibility for choice for sexual activity at all. But if then we're looking at uh, 16 or older, then we know that that's the age of consent. But what is the age difference between the parties? So maybe those close in age exceptions do come into play. What about how the relationship evolved? Did it happen quickly? Was it over the internet? Was it hidden? How did this relationship evolve? What degree of control or influence is over the child or youth, which then can help determine if this person is in a position of trust, authority, or dependency? So what this means, if you think about it, it could be a teacher, a mentor, pastor, a police officer, a landlord, uh, someone who is providing essential services or potentially withholding essential services of the child or youth. So that could include a guardian, a caregiver, etc. So these are some of the things that are kind of helpful to determine and to tease out those consent pieces and 
the choice piece as well. So let's take a moment and kind of go back. We're, we're going to talk about language again and the importance of language. A lot of what we do in the modules is that we talk a lot about the language we use, how to appropriately capture this issue, uh, and ensuring that people remain in control of their own stories. So you'll notice that uh, throughout this presentation, it seems like I'm using victim or survivor interchangeably. Now I'm not. <laughs> there, are, there are very specific pieces to this. Uh, so the top bullets that you see here under victim and survivor are really the dictionary definitions of the words. So certainly we know that survivors are also victims or have been victims at some point in their lives. Now what's interesting about these that you see is that even in the dictionary definition of survivor, it captures one important truth of being engaged in the sex trade. Many people don't survive. So it says here, a person who survives, especially at remaining alive after an event in which others have died. So this is something that our peer outreach workers remind us a lot. They talk about the people that they've lost due to violence in the trade. The other critical difference in the way we use it has to do with whether or not a person has, quote unquote, moved on from their experience. And if we're looking at a strengths based framework, maybe views their survival either as a horrific trauma or as being a source of strength to draw from, rather than a victim who might still be feeling oppressed or impacted as a result of the trauma. Victims may not recognize their victims and survivors might identify as being sex workers. So when we're working with people, we really need to pay attention and honor what language they are using and their own labels. So we at YWC Halifax, we feel comfortable using the label victim with children and youth engaged simply because of the inability to legally consent to participation. Now there is this level of discomfort in this feeling uh, that we're stripping youth of their agency by saying they can't legally consent. But if we create an environment that allows them to remain in control of their own stories and their labels, we aren't really stripping them of that agency. So important to also note, thinking back to that spectrum of choice is that depending on someone's experience, they may not identify as a victim. Now, we don't need people to identify as a victim in order to provide services to them if they do need them. Okay, I've been talking for a really long time. <laughs> I'm mindful of the time. I know that we're kind of coming up on uh, 2 p.m., but I do have an activity, and maybe what we can do, and Tara, you can correct me if, uh, if I'm wrong in this, is that I'll give the instructions for the activity. You can kind of take the break to think about it. Then when we come back, we can discuss it. Does that sound feasible? Yes, that would be great. Perfect. Okay. And awesome. I did just have, um, I know I'm, as the moderator, I, I probably am not supposed to be adding questions, but I did have one around your slide. Um, yeah. Around what about cognitive ability? Is this ever considered? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And again, that adds another layer of complexity. So when we are talking about those consent laws, et cetera, and looking at the ages, that's something that, that could be determined in court, for example. So even if someone is technically um, 16, their birthday says that they're 16, but they're operating on a different level, that would be taken into consideration. Absolutely. Okay, so we have this activity. So why does this all matter? Why did we just spend the last hour together, right? All this blah, blah, blah. So there's two terms that are listed on the slide. So on one hand, we see teen prostitute, and the other side, we see a victim of sexual exploitation. So what I'd like you to do over the break is think about these two different terms and think about someone you know who might not know anything about this. They're uneducated on the topic. They haven't spent the last hour here. Let's say they're reading this in a news article. They wake up in the morning. I get all my news from Facebook. So I'm looking at Facebook, checking things out. And I see a news article that on one hand, one news article says that we're, there's a teen prostitute in our community. And another news article is using the term, there's a victim of sexual exploitation in our community. So when you're thinking of this person who's uneducated on the topic and they're reading these news articles, what might be their knee jerk reaction to these two different terms? So if you think of what idea might come to their head, what images or words that might pop up for them. So think again of that kind of immediate reaction that someone might have to teen prostitute versus victim of sexual exploitation. So we'll take that break. 
make sure that, like I said, you, you do practice your self-care. I know this was a lot. I just imparted a lot of information. But take some time. Uh, maybe grab something to eat. Think about these two terms. And when we come back, uh, we'll discuss what things might come up for folks in those two terms. And hopefully then answer the question as to why this matters and why the last hour was just really important. Now, I don't know about you, but it's basically hot yoga up in my apartment here. <laughs> so <laughs> I appreciate, again, everybody sticking with us. I know that last hour was a lot of information, a lot of me talking. So the, the next part, there is a little more in interaction. I got some videos, I got some activities. So we'll jump back in. So I hope you had a chance to also think about uh, this activity in these two terms. So when we're talking about why this all matters, and especially when we talk about the language and even our understanding and developing a holistic understanding of CSEC and the issue, what kinds of things might come up for someone who doesn't have any knowledge about this issue when we're looking at these two different terms? So I'll just bring up the next slide here, which is the discussion questions. So I just want you to use the chat um, and you're, you're welcome to kind of say anything that may have come up for you or for someone that you think is uneducated on this topic, your neighbor, your friend, your coworker. But first of all, what ideas or images do you think are communicated through these terms? And you can use either. So if we're talking about teen prostitute or victim of sexual exploitation, what kind of ideas or images are coming up for folks when they hear that? And there's no wrong answers. <laughs> so anything you think that like someone's knee jerk reaction, what might they be thinking? So teen prostitute diminishes the girl, words like slut or whore come to mind, exactly. So there's this stigma attached to it, right? Even the word prostitute itself, when you're looking at the dictionary definition, it, it talks about debasing oneself for profit. So even in the dictionary definition, it's, it's very clear that that kind of negative association. As someone has said, when I was in high school, we used the term pro as short for prostitute. But it, of course, it implies a professional. Yeah, exactly. And if we're thinking about, okay, it's a teen professional, teen prostitute, right? What, what does that bring up? Some may lay blame. So one is choice rather than forced. Yeah. And it implies that there's permission given. Exactly. I think really that, that piece around choice, right? So if we think back to the spectrum of choice, those consent laws and kind of how it all plays out, that really one of the reasons that we don't use the word prostitute, um, even though prostitution is in our laws, is, is because it, it doesn't really encompass the full complexity of the issue, right? And when we're thinking that, you know, teen prostitute, it's like, well, it's someone has made that choice and they're, they're choosing to participate. But if they're a teen, can they choose? Can they give consent? The blanket answer is no, right? Under our laws, they cannot. Uh, they might think they're making that choice, thinking back to that spectrum of choice itself. But, you know, even if we just change the word to child, all of a sudden that changes things. So versus teen prostitute, if we say child prostitute, yes, someone has said, I'm reminded of the underage woman versus child. Yes. Who is an underage woman? They're a child, right? Folks who are 16 or 17, if you think like teen prostitute, maybe that, that comes to mind like older teens and they're making that choice. But under our laws, someone under the age of 18 is a child, right? I wouldn't go and, and say that to a teenager's face. You know, you're a child, but under our laws, that's, that's reality. Someone has also said teen prostitute implies choice and control on the part of the teen, whereas a victim implies there's a third party and really highlights that lack of choice and consent. Yeah. Someone else has pointed out that the responsibility should be with the buyer, potentially. Yeah, that can absolutely come up. A lot of what we're talking about is kind of um, what's, what may, what's maybe internal for the person who's participating, but there's also that external, right? Those um, coming from the outside, looking in. And that even brings us to, to some of these other questions, right? How does this impact how children and youth might be seen and treated based on the different terms we use? Or how should the problem be addressed? So if, if you're saying the responsibility should maybe be with the buyer, so we're, we might be saying that the responsibility lies with, with those folks to determine um, you know, who might be a victim, who, uh, who might be underage, et cetera. 
A victim also opens the door for the question of social context and systems that enable the exploitation. Absolutely. If we look at it kind of larger, if we kind of take that piece and then we start looking at these larger systems that have enabled this to happen, um, you know, looking even in, let's say, our normalization of it in our culture, right? Uh, and and how it's the, the uh, teens participating and children participating is really, it intersects with the adult sex trade. So sometimes there can be this conflation of the two issues. So absolutely, that's so true. And in some of our other modules, we do go deeper into that and looking at these kind of more systemic things. So taking it, taking the onus away from the individual and even potentially the other players in it and going further out and looking at these systems, looking at systemic racism, looking at legacy of colonization, looking at poverty, et cetera, that might be contributing to, to these things happening. Any other thoughts around uh, the importance of language and even how these different terms might impact how we see youth or children or how it's addressed? It's always interesting being online, you gotta get used to kind of uncomfortable silences <laughs> while I wait for people to type. <laughs> So yeah, so in, uh, and to someone who said, I'm grateful for this distinction. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. I'm glad. I wonder how a teen would feel about this language. Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, we, uh, I did bring it up really briefly when I talked about allowing folks to, to be in charge of their, their own stories and to still have agency over that, right? So even when I'm talking about a victim or survivor, and when I'm talking to someone, like I said, I'm not going to go to a teenager and say, you're a child, that's not going to go over well, right? I'm going to use the language that they're using. But in terms of kind of looking at the broader issue itself, uh, just to let you know that that's partly why we use, we, we choose to use the, the CSEC language versus other types of language, because it really then captures the complexity of the issue and all of these various experiences that people are having in it. But that's actually a really good question. Uh, potentially as we do more work with youth and, and looking at engaging survivors um, uh, in our survivor advisories, we can bring up that question and just say, you know, hey, what do you think about this language? What comes up for you when we look at this, these two terms? So I appreciate that. So kind of just to summarize, these are some things that might have come up. So even if we're looking at images that people might see, so kind of think of mainstream folks, you know, the general person, kind of um, your neighbor, your friend, etc. what might be coming up for them. So I think all of these things came up. Uh, victim might be, people might think that they've been forced, they're trafficked. You might see pictures come up like this. You often see like hands over mouths. You might see folks kind of like doing this. Um, certainly people like this and they have, um, and they've got handcuffs around them or they're tied up or that kind of thing. So even in kind of this larger mainstream culture and, and what we see for these images, that might be something that comes up. Versus a teen prostitute, like you see in the image here, you might think of like someone who's walking the street, right? Um, someone in short skirt and stilettos and fishnets and that kind of thing. So we're looking at maybe they chose to do that. They are they are defined maybe more as sex worker. But then even in terms of services itself and how we provide services, one person might be seen more worthy of help or services and the other person being unworthy based on the fact that they might have chosen this. They're part of a certain community. There's stigma attached to it. There's racism at play. It's just one of those girls. It's not our issue. You know, you made your you made your bed, you lie in it kind of idea. Victim is seen as innocent, the other person seen as more guilty. And then when we think in a larger sense, whose problem is this? How do we address this? A teen prostitute might be seen as an, it's an individual problem. It's their problem. They did this. Or even a community problem. You know, that only happens in North Dartmouth. That's a North Dartmouth problem. That's not our problem. Whereas a victim of sexual exploitation, we look at it more as a societal problem, as a larger issue. Um, and sorry, go ahead. Sarah. So Natalie uh, says that uh, we're classifying race and, and economics and uh, in ca categories as well and stereotypes. That's yes. what she also thinks of. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, you captured it. Yeah, there's a lot of stereotypes that are at play here. And, and this, you know, helps capture why language is so important, right? So it does seem like it's just a little thing, but it's extremely important. 
So now we kind of shift a little bit. So now that we've teased out the kind of complexities of the language and we're looking at a criminal code and all this com these complexities of the issue itself, we're going to shift a little bit to talk about the culture and lifestyle of the game and then who are the players. So the game, the reason it's in quotes here is that this, this is a slang term. And so it's, it's a term that is used for the activity of sex worker exploitation. So you'll often hear folks who are engaged call it the game, uh, might be the life or something like that. So the, again, speaking of language, this is a word that folks who are engaged in participating are using themselves. So again, we try to reflect that. So that's what the game is. Now, it exists as a subculture. So the reason that we bring up the, the, the sense of the notion of culture and all of this. I mean, culture can be quite broad, right? It's language, it's norms, it's laws, it's politics, it's economics, et cetera, all shared by a people in a time or place. That's really the dictionary definition of it. But then we think of what, what is mainstream culture? So if we look at Canadian culture as a whole, or we look at it smaller than that. So you know, Nova Scotia has a particular culture, but even mainland Nova Scotia versus Cape Breton have slightly different cultural aspects. So the reason that we include this here as a mention is that the game is a culture of its own. It's a subculture that exists outside the mainstream culture. So it's really important for us as service providers to not only understand how the culture is portrayed, how the game is portrayed on the outside, so looking at how teens and, and children and youth are seeing it from the outside, but also what are the realities inside the game? So as an example, this, often it's a lavish lifestyle that's been romanticized by pop culture, right? Think of Pretty Woman, Secret Diary of a Call Girl, that kind of thing. I always date myself a little bit when I talk about music videos and thinking of like 50 Cent music videos. But there's a new one recently called, um, there's an artist called Doja Cat, and she has a song called Bottom Bitch, which is a slang term as well that's used in the game. So it is in mainstream culture, and it's very romanticized. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, looks like a lot of fun right? The reality is that it, it can include gang or ring activity, so exploitation rings or trafficking rings. So if you think of Hell's Angels as an example, there certainly can be uh, that criminal type activity and, and these larger gangs or rings. But again, there is, I think, this misconception that that is always how this happens. And it's not quite true. There can also be independent agents. So perpetrators that are operating on their own, uh, or with their friends or, you know, operating what they think is a kind of a small business. So it can include independent agents who are the perpetrators as well. It's very hierarchically organized. So if you think of kind of a pyramid, and I'll ask the question to you. So in this pyramid in the game, who do you think is at the top? Who's controlling everything? The P word. You got it, the pimp, yeah. So pimp or the perpetrator is, is at the top there. So very much hierarchically organized. So you'll see the pimp or the perpetrator at the top and then underneath there are people in his or her, his or her stable that have very specific roles. So some girls might have higher status than others and might play different roles. So for example, someone might be more of a peer recruiter. So they may have started in a different way, but at this point they're also in this um, in this odd place where at one, on one hand, they're also a victim, but on the other hand, they're also a perpetrator because they've moved into a more peer recruitment role for various reasons. There are very specific rules and roles. Like I said, you know, some of those roles are hierarchically organized and we look at kind of who the players are in the next slide, but there's very strict roles, uh, sorry, rules around appearance. You know, you gotta be in tip top shape. Uh, you gotta sell to customers. They gotta wanna buy, right? what you can do, who you can talk to. So loyalty and obedience are of very high importance. So all of these types of norms exist in the game. It also has its own language, its own slang, its own lingo, right? The game being one of them. Another one I mentioned is bottom bitch, stable, all these different terms. So in, uh, in conjunction and, and in collaboration with survivors, we have developed a glossary of terms that are used in the game. And we, we did this in order to assist service providers to not only be able to identify the various terms that might come up so you can hear it when someone is using those terms. And that might be a way that you can identify that this might be happening, that someone is, is being recruited or someone's participating, but also in order to understand what they mean, because it's not a victim's job to educate us, right? 
we got to do the work beforehand. We got to come into this. We, we got to know what they're talking about. I like to say, you know, if we're going to walk this journey with them in order to walk the walk, we do have to talk the talk. We need to understand what is the language, what's the slang, what's the lingo, and what it means. So when we are talking about the game, we, we kind of think of the people involved as the players. That's what we like to, to call it. So we have the perpetrators. Uh, so those would be controlling and managing uh, the business. So it could be called pimps, might be called daddies, mothers, madams. Um, you know, we we generally see that there is this also there is this kind of gender bias that I think that folks generally think that it is men who are the perpetrators. Uh, but we'll do an activity in a moment around you know who you think the perpetrator is, uh, kind of challenging some of those uh, myth busting a little bit and challenging those assumptions. We have the purchasers, so these are the people that are paying for the commercial sexual services. Sometimes they're called tricks or Johns or Janes and the victims. So those are uh, the folks that are supplying the commercial services. So maybe they are called hookers, hoes, prostitutes, could be things that they call themselves as right uh, as well. So it could be the language that they're using or language that people have put on them. So when we do other modules, we actually go deeper into all these different players and, and talk uh, in, in a lot of detail uh, around the various factors that kind of come into play. But one of the things that we're going to do, we are going to do an activity here. This is kind of a fun one. You don't have to type anything. I just want you to close your eyes. So close your eyes and picture a pimp. So we're thinking of their gender, their age, what is their race, what kind of clothes are they wearing, what's their class or their economic status, and what community are they from? So if you close your eyes and you're picturing this, Everybody got it in their head? I'm gonna show you a couple pictures. Did anybody picture this person? It's kind of a joke. <laughs> so of course this person's not a pimp, right? He is wearing what could be called the pimp costume or the zoot suit, It's kind of from the 1970s and it shows this uh, maybe urban African-American man uh, in this style of clothes. So people might think of this when they think of pimp. This is the Halloween costume. Right. Now, what about this guy? So this might be closer to what you pictured and you wouldn't be incorrect. So some pimps do look like this. Uh, his name is Owen Gibson Skier, and he was the first person charged with human trafficking in Nova Scotia in 2017. What about this person? Did you picture a person who looked like this? So this is Renee Weber. Uh, she was 43 when she was convicted, uh, five charges of trafficking a person under the age of 18, receiving material benefit, sexual exploitation, advertising sexual services, and procuring a person under 18 to provide sexual services for consideration. She's a mother of four, and this was her first offense. So she was sentenced to four years in prison, uh, but was released on bail in 2019, and she's since appealed her, con her conviction. What about this guy? When I do this training with uh, with the the other person who's part of test staff, my boss Charlene, she also she often says that this is the last person that she would think of who might be a pimp. So this is Duncan Robertson Wright. Uh, he is a, a local guy from Spryfield. He was 44 years old in 2017 when he was arrested and facing 20 charges related to human trafficking. So initially, three victims came forward between the ages of 14 and 17, but then this grew to eight victims and 25 charges. So uh, Mr. Wright dragged his trial out by firing his lawyer, and although he was briefly released on bail, uh, police managed to get him back and hold him in custody until his trial in 2019. But by the time the trial happened, the eight victims were reduced to one courageous victim left willing to testify against him. So 25 charges were reduced to two, and the Crown accepted a plea deal. So after uh, time served, Duncan is actually now currently out in the community, and he is a registered sex offender. What about this guy? I think most folks know who this is, right? Well, this is Jeffrey Epstein. Of course, he never saw his day in court, uh, but his uh, perpetration of human trafficking and exploitation is well documented in the new Netflix limited series called Filthy Rich. Uh, and we really highly recommend that you watch that. Uh, kind of shows a lot of the tactics that, uh, that he used to, to exploit people. And last, 
what about this person? Anybody kind of picture this fresh faced beauty? So this is Alison Mack. Uh, she was an actor on the show Smallville and she was tangled up in uh, what was called the Nexium human trafficking cult scandal. So she was initially charged with sex trafficking and com conspiracy to commit sex trafficking and forced labor, but she reversed her initial not guilty plea and admitted to racketeering uh, charges instead. So the point of that activity is not only to, to challenge your stereotypes, right, and kind of challenge some biases and show you some of the folks that uh, are perpetrators and are pimps and have been charged um, and have this is documented. But really the point here is that perpetrators don't always look like pimps, right? They're very hard to profile and there's really a wide range of people charged and convicted of human trafficking and related sexual offenses. So in terms of that kind of problem blindness, the same thing applies here. If we allow our biases and stereotypes to guide our judgment, we might misinterpret what we're seeing. On one hand, we might see something that's not there, or on the other hand, we might miss something that's there. So just a couple things in terms of some protective factors against predators. So we, we do go more into this in these other modules. This is very much just kind of an overview. But when we're thinking of that pimps really have no profile, right? So some of the things that can be helpful when, when we're talking to youth and working with youth on this is that instead of focusing on what a pimp might look like and, you know, thinking of those stereotypes, have discussions about warning signs for luring and grooming. So we spend a good portion of time in our second module that we've developed around pathways to entry talking about what learning and grooming looks like so that you as a service provider can also understand that whole process. It's very methodical, it's prepared, it's well thought out, it's documented. So we also need to impart that information to our children and youth. So education and awareness really comes into play here in terms of protective factors and prevention. So not only about identifying sexual predators, but awareness about healthy relationships and internet safety is huge. So we do spend a lot of time in one of the modules talking about online recruitment and grooming and what that looks like and the myriad of ways that perpetrators are using the internet to recruit young people. So if you think of where do young people hang out, right? They hang out online. They're glued to their phones, their tablets, their computers, especially now during the pandemic and COVID. And we've seen it. Um, an article came out recently that uh, in terms of just the stats of reported online exploitation and online recruitment has really skyrocketed during the pandemic. And so information about internet safety is so key. We can recognize the early warning signs of involvement in the sex trade. Um, if we have time, we'll go over some of those just really briefly. Again, we spend a lot of time in, in our module three when we're talking about best practices in terms of working with youth that we go really deep into that so that folks can have a, a very broad understanding of what some of the early warning signs might be. And then being present where children and youth regularly gather and hang out in the community and including online. So not only knowing where they're hanging out online, but you know, you as a caregiver, as a parent, as a safe and trusted adult in a youth's life, being present uh, is, is very important. Um, I was, well, I'll mention this as one of the resources and I was in this presentation yesterday for, for the time that I was able to be there uh, with regards to the kids in the know resource. And so even in terms of, um, you know, you accessing that resource as an educator and then being able to impart that knowledge and use that in your classrooms, it's a huge protective factor. Uh, and, and that's a really, really great resource that, uh, that can be accessed. Okay, so I do have a video for you. So I got to go and change how I'm sharing this. So this video is um, an MTVU. So it's coming out of the state. So it's a human trafficking PSA that they created. And it's, it's helpful because, you know, when we're talking about the different players, so we very briefly talked about the perpetrators and what some of the myths might be around who that is. And then now we kind of talk about who are the purchasers. So again, we have some misconceptions around that. So hopefully this, uh, this video does a great job in terms of showing who the, the sorry, the purchasers might be. Uh, so we'll, uh, we'll take a moment to watch. My father abused me. I've lived in four different foster homes. 
I don't even know how many men I've been with. I've been doing this since I was 14. And I'm tired. I don't like this. Is this all I'm good for? Do you even care who I am? Just relax. All right. What did you think of that? Yeah, it's hard to watch, right? Yeah. I've watched that video many times now doing these trainings and I still kind of get these, these uncomfortable goosebumps, right? Uh, third time you've seen it and it's still upsetting. Yeah, very much so. I mean, I think it does a pretty good job in terms of showing who, who the purchasers are. You know, I think it's hard to wrap our head around it. Like if I were to ask the pretty bald question, right? Like who is buying sex from children? And this shows that it's, it's a variety of people who are buying. Purchasers come from all walks of life. You know, I think that this, this video does racial profile a little bit, the, the, the person who's providing the sexual services. Um, and it does only show men that are buying. So, you know, it does have some uh, drawbacks there, but it does at least show this, this idea that purchasers come from, you know, they're, they're different people, they're different ages, they're young people, they're attractive people, you know, they're, they're older people, they're wealthy, they're poor, they're all these things in between. Natalie's saying it's hard to watch, but the more I see these and feel uncomfortable, I'm reminded why we need to do a better job as adults to safeguard kids and the role of schools in health education. Absolutely, it's so key. I mean, that's why I'm here today, right? Is even just to impart that and how key it is. We need to not turn the blind spot and use the resources, absolutely. So just to kind of give you another idea here to show you like who the purchasers might be, right? So they're, they're folks that view sex as a product or service to be bought and sold. So looking at it simply as a transaction. Like I mentioned before, that there's, there's this very little distinction between youth and adults engaged. And that's really tricky. So even the presence of the adult sex industry, while you know, legal and illegal to a varying degree, uh, and looking at people's autonomy to, as adults to participate in the sex trade, that there isn't a distinction between youth and adults. So the purchasers are generally not gonna be asking, you know, are you over the age of 18? Is someone forcing you to do this? And even if they were to ask that, you know, how easy is it to get a fake ID? Uh, victims are often coached on what to say, and so they'll act as if they're reading from a script. So it, it adds that complexity of it. There's often no consideration of a victim's rights or autonomy. Now, purchasers can be male or female. In general, the vast majority of purchasers are male. Uh, but we also see, you know, married or partnered men and women who are seeking these kind of no strings attached sexual encounters. It might be single men and women who have difficulty forming healthy relationships. If you think of the incel movement, uh, those are folks who might be purchasing. Could be couples who wanna add some spice to their relationship, they wanna add a third. And wealthy and powerful men and women who require ego fulfillment. So thinking back to Jeffrey Epstein and looking at the Filthy Rich documentary, that really shows that piece of it, of you know him feeling like this, he wasn't doing anything wrong, that this was really his right um, uh, to, to exploit people in that way. So now shifting our focus again, we're kind of looking at who might the victims be. So we want to break this down a little bit. Who's at risk? So it's people who are under 18 years old. They spend unsupervised time alone or with their peers. They own a cell phone or a computer. They have at least one social media account. They're attracted to consumer goods. They desire development of romantic relationships. They sometimes feel insecure, alone, or misunderstood. They might fight with their parents or their caregivers or feel like those people don't care. They want more independence and they're testing boundaries and taking risks. So who is this describing? What's kind of glaring from this list?
everyone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Every teenager ever, right? And I don't love to read off PowerPoints, but I do that on purpose because really the point is, is that basically all youth are at risk. So again, I think that, you know, when we're doing this myth, myth busting and in these modules and all the training that we do, and again, just trying to challenge people's stereotypes, you know, thinking back to the activity we did with teen prostitute versus victim of sexual exploitation, we might even also have ideas that come to our mind of who is at risk. And it's only certain youth. It's only kids from bad homes. It's only kids from certain communities. It's only youth who are, you know, uh, have addictions. It's only this, it's only that. But really, it's important to broaden our understanding and start here. And that basically, it's all youth are at risk. But there's also other things that are at play. So individual factors, which are events or characteristics of an individual's life. So you think of uh, the fa family dynamic that's happening at home, maybe someone's sexual orientation can put them at greater risk. There's environmental factors that come from a child's neighborhood or community. So this can be bullying at school or if they're experiencing community isolation and social factors, which is the foundation that's set up in our culture that makes this issue possible in the first place or ways in which we even perpetuate or promote sexual exploitation. So if you think about systemic racism, legacy of colonization, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls, all of these things play into risk factors. So that previous list really is not comprehensive, right? And neither is this one, but it just gives you an idea in terms of how these things then intersect. So we start with all youth are at risk. Then we look at who is at highest risk or higher risk. And if we think of how these factors can intersect, how they can compound to create uh, this area in between where someone is at higher risk of being recruited and lured and groomed into the sex trade. So, you know, if we're looking at some of these are pretty universal, right? Low self-esteem, lack of confidence, need for approval, need for love. I think of myself at 15 and I'm like, yep, check, check, check. So sometimes these can, these can be pretty universal, which, which isn't an easy answer. Uh, you might have noticed throughout all of this that there's really no easy answer, right? It is complex. That's kind of the point. Someone might be struggling with what's happening at home. There's some family dynamic. Things are changing. It's an unhealthy home environment. Lack of social support networks. Problems at school or bullying. Certainly, if there's a history of abuse, not even necessarily sexual abuse. It can be physical. It can be emotional. But absolutely, if there's sexual abuse, kind of leads to this uh, normalization of the issue. Um, and, and ties that into the, the experience for the child or youth. Gender identity and sexual orientation. So I did also already mention that we do know that this is disproportionately affecting uh, our trans and queer communities as well. And, and although we don't have a lot of information on that, we do know that that puts folks at greater risk because those things are, you know, if someone someone's gender identity or sexual orientation are still what is considered outside the norm, it puts them at risk for a lot of other things too, right? They're being othered. They're, they're outside the mainstream. Racial identification, absolutely, looking at systemic racism, it kind of bleeds into those social and systemic factors, right? So if we're looking at gender inequity, social marginalization, poverty, toxic masculinity, et cetera, et cetera, all of these things, they all come together to kind of create this perfect storm of risk. So really, the, the point of this is that Perpetrators of commercial sexual exploitation, what they're doing is they're seeking out those vulnerabilities and then exploiting them. So, for example, if someone you know, shows that they have a need for love, they're going to establish themselves maybe as a boyfriend or as a girlfriend, as a partner. If someone is really struggling at home and maybe there's just not a lot of engagement with their parents or things are really tough, they might establish themselves as a parental figure, as their daddy, right? If someone is living in poverty uh, or doesn't have access to lots of economic opportunities, the perpetrator might come in and shower them with gifts or might have a, you know, have false advertisement for a job that pays really well dancing in the city. So what, what perpetrators are doing is they're finding out these risk factors or, or another word could be vulnerabilities. And what they're doing is then exploiting those things. So again, in other modules that we have, we, we do talk specifically about how they do that. So pathways to entry and how they they get this information and the the very uh, this process that they go through in terms of luring and recruiting and grooming. So just to kind of sum it up in terms of who's most vulnerable, 
Uh, this is something that came out of a Children of the Night Parent Toolkit. Uh, there's an organization out in BC that has created some great toolkits. There's one for service providers and there's one for parents talking about this issue. And so if we then put it all together, so if we understand all youth are at risk, but there are certain things that put folks at higher risk, and then this would be folks who are most vulnerable because they have the most risk factors, right? So runaway homeless or impoverished youth, youth who are in care, there's been an experience of abuse or neglect, those who are African Nova Scotian, Indigenous, or in 2S LGBTQ communities, if youth are living in isolated or rural communities, they have cognitive disabilities or learning impairments, including if they live with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, if they're struggling with alcohol or drug addiction, and if they have low self-esteem or confidence, and if they don't have a sense of belonging to any group or community. So again, this is just a really brief overview. Um, in the other modules, we do go deeper into this and kind of seeing how it plays out. But one thing to note is the only way to protect against or prevent commercial sexual exploitation is to reduce those vulnerabilities. So if we're looking at you know, prevention, we also need to have intervention and aftercare, but prevention is so key. And that is why training matters. That is why it's so important for educators to understand the issue and then to know how it's showing up, what are the pathways to entry, and then how do I work with youth that this is happening to? Right. So really, if I were to say kind of sum up my presentation today, it would be around that, that this is why it matters. So, again, I do have a couple protective factors against risk. And then we have one more activity uh, looking at specific risk factors and asking you to identify them in a video. But this comes from uh, Jane Runner and Jennifer Richardson. So Jane Runner runs an organization out of Manitoba. Uh, Transition and Education Resources for Females, which is TERF, uh, which is an unfortunate acronym, but uh, she's been doing this work and she's a survivor herself. So it's a survivor-led organization and been doing this work for decades. So again, these are things that, uh, you know, we, we rely on other experts in the field. Like we're, we're not coming in and saying, this is how it's done. This is how we think we should do it. We're working all together in a collaborative way uh, to be able to impart this knowledge and working with folks who not only have experienced this themselves, but have been working in this field for a long time um, and who are experts in, in the field who can then give us you know, guidance and direction on how we can deal with this. So just a couple things that they bring up. Uh, first being listening to and believing children and youth when they reach out for help. It's so important that, and this came up in the presentation yesterday with Kids in the Know, there was a video that they showed and I thought it was, it was so important, is that if we don't listen to and we don't believe children when they do reach out for help, even that act of reaching out for help is so huge and may not happen, right? But when they do, if someone then reacts in such a way that they don't believe them, they react in disgust, uh, they don't wanna hear about it, you know, it's too much to think about, why did you do this to yourself? Why did you sell yourself? All these different things that people might react in such a way, or even that they just don't believe that it's happened. How could this happen? Who is buying sex from children, right? That then it really, the, the child or youth can just turn away and then they have this, this second trauma that they're experiencing, not only the trauma of their experience, but then the trauma of someone not believing them and not assisting them and not reacting in a way that's appropriate. So really that's that's the first thing. And when we go into module three, one of uh, with best practices in terms of working with youth, we go really deep into that in what are the best practices to listen and believe children and youth when they reach out. Getting children and youth in structured activities in the community. So if we think that some of those risk factors are a lack of confidence, low self-esteem, no sense of belonging or low sense of belonging in their school, in their home, in their community, et cetera, this is a way that some of those risk factors might be able to be met, right? It could be recreational opportunities. It could be connection to the land. It could be all these different things, but in a structured way that can build community and that children and youth can learn new skills and try new activities. I mean, we know that children and youth are trying on all these different masks, right? All these different facades, kind of trying to figure out who they are, where they belong. And so giving them opportunities to, to learn those things in a way that is healthy uh, is definitely a protective factor. Building a meaningful and effective relationship so you as a safe and trusted adult in the youth life, like we really underscore the importance of this in our modules. And we, we seem to harp on it a little bit, I think, of how important that is to for youth and children to have even just one person in their life that is safe, that is trusted, 
that will listen to them, believe them, uh, that they can reach out to. And it's all about building those relationships with youth. And it's so important. Providing youth with opportunities to explore their interests. So like I mentioned, you know, this could be structured activities, but even just healthy ways to explore what they like to do, uh, you know, what uh, what they want for their future and that kind of thing is really important as they're trying on all these different types of friends and cliques and appearance and all these things is, is giving them opportunities to explore that in a safe and healthy way. Helping children and youth to understand and manage the change process. So we know that this is a huge time of change. You know that. I know that. We've experienced it, right? And the, the kids that we work with, the youth that we work with are experiencing it, not only physically, but emotionally, and even now, I mean, imagine the pandemic and what, what kind of change that's created for so many families and for so many folks and how, what is the effect on people? If you don't have coping mechanisms to be able to manage all these different changes that are happening in your life, then you might look for ways, you know, or you might be recruited into more unhealthy ways to deal with those things. And understanding the realities of child and youth sexual behavior and activity, you know, regardless of our own thoughts on it, right? Again, I think of myself at 15 and it's like, you know, at the time sending nudes was not really a thing. Figuring out, figuring out how to text with T9 was more the thing. Whereas now it's so normal for youth and children who are developing relationships, regardless if they're exploitative or not, to send intimate photos and send nudes and to sext and that kind of thing. So even if we have our own opinions and our own thoughts on the matter, but even having an understanding of what are the realities for children and youth is a way that we can then be able to understand when something might be happening, when something is unhealthy, when someone might be lured or recruited or groomed into participation in the sex trade. I just wanted to peek at the, the comments just before we go on to the next activity. Um, so someone has said that I think the Me Too movement has posted the conversation to include men. Yeah. As much as we want to protect girls, although we know more than girls are exploited, we also need to talk to boys, although not all perpetrators are men about this issue. Very much so, you know, and that's the importance of looking at it holistically as well. And that's one of the things that we're really trying to do uh, in our partnership is, you know, how do we work with men and work with boys and, and making sure that they're included in this holistic understanding? Because there is this, this gender difference, there is a gender bias, and we recognize that, but we can't leave people out of the equation, right? Uh, and then someone has said, you know, thinking about the complexities, the critical role of equitable early years education and how we support families and poverty and systemic oppression. It's not small, but it's important to begin. Absolutely. And we start to think even bigger and we think of all these risk factors. And those are risk factors for other things, too. Right. Not just sexual exploitation and trafficking. So how do we then meet those larger factors? Can I just. Say oh, you're on mute there, Natalie. Thanks. The um, the um, your point on this protective factor slide, the, the second from the bottom about how important it is to help children and youth understand and manage the change process um, really stands out for me, particularly given this time. And I think as adults, um, adults in the lives of children, whether it's parents, um, you know, uh, caregivers, guardians of children and teachers, I think the more we are able, able to at least that we show them that we're not managing all the change really well. It just occurred to me how much this is going to leave our children vulnerable and how important it is when we go back to schools, even if we have these fears uh, around the uncertainty, how important it is for us to kind of, um, uh, you know, um, you know, play a little fake it till you make it or play a pretend game mm -hmm. so that our youth, they need to know that the adults in their life are like, this is big. We have protective things, but we can do this. And um, I really appreciate you pointing that um, protective factor um, in regards to this um, topic out. Because um, I, I think like all of us, I worry about our kids. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Yeah. Thanks for that, Natalie. I appreciate that. So I have another activity for you. So we're looking specifically at risk factors. So I'm going to just stop the PowerPoint and I'm going to bring up a video. So I do encourage you to have something to write with. Uh, the, the risk factors that are presented come pretty quick. <laughs> uh, so I'll share the video. It's just a couple minutes long. Uh, and then we'll come back together and we'll discuss it. Meet Alexa. Alexa grew up in a middle class suburb with her mom and dad. Six years ago, her dad was in a car accident and developed an opioid addiction. 
Alexa is now 18, and since then, her life has been hectic. Her mom works constantly to support the family and pay the bills, though Alexa feels that even if her mom could stop working so much, she just prefers not being around. When her mom is home, the house is filled with fighting. Even when there isn't, Alexa feels alone, like the house is filled with three ghosts. Alexa resents her mom for never being home and leaving her to look after everything. Alexa resents her dad for always being upset and being an addict. Sometimes when her dad goes to buy pills, she'll go with him. Over the years, she's gotten used to the strange people, lewd conversations, and volatile environment. Alexa is in her last year at school. One day, on her way home, a man stopped and called out to her. You're just too pretty, I had to stop, he said. Alexa felt embarrassed, looked down, and smiled, thinking no one ever compliments her, especially not an older man. The man asked what grade she was in. She told him she was a senior. He asked about school and her friends. She said school was okay, better than at home at least, but that she didn't have any friends. The man said she needed some fun in her life and asked if he could call her. Alexa gave her number. That was two weeks ago, and since then Alexa spends all day and night talking with her new boyfriend. He's her Prince Charming. He listens to her problems and tells her he loves her, and that if she comes and stays with him, he'll take care of her. He works at a men's club outside of town managing the dancers. He loves to bring Alexa to work with him. The people are a little strange, like when she goes with her dad, but she feels pretty when they all fuss over her hair and nails. They dress her up, and her boyfriend buys her new clothes that he says make her look more sexy. He loves to give her presents. He tells her how he wants to make her dreams come true, but that they'll have to save up money to get a proper place. He's been living out of a hotel with some of the dancers. Her boyfriend shares that he's been struggling with money, always spending too much on Alexa. He says sometimes he feels used like she doesn't even love him. Alexa tells him how much she loves him and asks if she can help make money like the other girls. All right. So what, uh, oh no, you couldn't hear any of it? <laughs> Were people living to hill that hear that? It was lower than the other, but I could, we could hear, I think some people could hear it anyway. Okay. Okay, good. I was thinking, oh no. <laughs> okay. So what were some of the risk factors that you identified in that video? So isolation, yeah. There was addictions happening in the family. Mm -hmm. So that family dynamic, but also the issue of addiction. No friends. So this, you know, lack of self sense of belonging, lack of community, low self esteem. Absolutely. Needing attention and wanting something to do. I mean, boredom can even play into this. Absolutely. And did you notice something right at the beginning of the video? So sort of before some of these risk factors came into play, what kind of home was Alexa growing up in? If anybody caught that. So mention that she uh, you might not have been able to hear it. Oh yeah, you got it. Yeah. So middle class. So grew up in a middle class home, maybe a good home, two parents, right? So even challenging that uh, misconception that it's only people coming from certain homes, it's only kids from quote unquote bad homes, one parent, etc. So, you know, I, I think it does a good job in, in showing that it can happen to any youth, right? Uh, so other people have said not connected to a caring adult. So yeah, feeling like, you know, we've, even if she, even if her mom could, she just didn't want to be in the home. That's why she was working so much. Exposure to the subculture already, absolutely. So in terms of when we were talking about her father's addiction, and so this sort of normalized things for her that she was already really uh, exposed to this other subculture. Uh, and so it, it, it didn't feel like such a huge change when she was then recruited and, and groomed into this. 
So sort of for extra points, what was her pathway to entry? So how did the perpetrator insert themselves in her life? Complimented her. Yeah. Compliments, gifts, romance. Yes, exactly. You got it. So yeah, so this person asking questions, yeah, gathering information, that's all part of that uh, learning process. So getting information on what the, um, what her risk factors are, what her vulnerabilities are, and trying to meet them in a way and exploiting them. Guilt, yes. So if you think back to that spectrum of choice, Alexa would most likely fit in that perceived choice. So at this point, you know, the guilt and that kind of thing that was coming and she developed this relationship with what she thought was a boyfriend. And, and at that point, uh, you know, then said, well, I want to help. So it seems like she's making the choice to contribute to the family and then participating, ended up participating in the sex trade. So great job. You get gold stars. <laughs> I think you got all of them. So I know I'm just mindful of the time. Uh, so there might be some slides that I am going to skip. Uh, but these, these slides, I will make them available um, on the Google Drive that I think everybody can access. But like I said, we do go deeper into um, specifically around identification and if there is a disclosure, um, what are some best practices around that? So we do go much deeper into that in our module three. Um, but the point being here is that it is easier to get youth out before they become entrenched. And that's why prevention is so huge. You know, we do have, are working on to put a system in place with the test partnership uh, to create a system of response, which is more around intervention and aftercare. But we also looking at this issue holistically understand the huge importance of prevention. And when we talk about these pathways to entry in one of the modules and looking at the various tactics that perpetrators use to entrench a youth in the game, uh, it becomes very clear sorry, becomes very clear uh, that once they're entrenched, just how much more difficult it would be to be able to get them out or for them to want to get out, you know, looking at, uh, at that choice kind of idea again. And if they feel like they're choosing to be with this person, to contribute to the family, to participate. So um, I am going to skip through these ones. Like I said, these would we we would go over in uh, module three. These are kind of warning signs that uh, someone might be recruited or participating in a sex trade. So we do go over those in module three. But I do want to talk really quickly about if disclosure does happen. So it, it's really unlikely that someone's going to walk into your office or come talk to you and say, I'm a victim of sexual exploitation. If it happens, let us know. <laughs> but I think it's unlikely. But disclosures might happen in other ways. So they might say, my boyfriend is asking me to do something that I'm not comfortable with. Or even a friend might come to you and say, you know what, my friend has told me that this is happening and I'm worried about them. So even if a youth discloses something that sounds like it might be exploitation or trafficking, these are the things to remember. So first of all, don't panic. I think it can be really alarming to hear, it can be really shocking that this is happening and really easy for us to kind of freak out or overreact. But kids pick up on that. Kids pick up on fear, uncertainty. And so really being mindful of your, your own self, your own reactions is so key. Your job is to listen, believe and validate. Address confidentiality. So you are going to need to build a trusting relationship with the youth to be able to effectively support them. And one way to foster trust is around that transparency and honesty about what your own professional boundaries are. So there's the duty to report, but you might have your own uh, issues around confidentiality within your work that you need to address as well. So you need to figure out kind of what that is, but also being very open with the youth uh, around that. Let the youth set the pace. So it's really understandable if you want to gather all the information, right? About the perpetrator, about how this happened, everything that kind of led up to the situation. But really try not to take over the disclosure and over question the youth about what happened to them. So one of our peer outreach workers uses this term that you see on the, on the screen there, avoid being a popcorn eater. So what she means is that, and this, this was an experience that she's had a few times, is the service provider or counselor wants like all the nitty gritty details, all the trauma, all the drama. But some things youth are not ready to disclose, or we shouldn't try to force that disclosure in any way. 
The other thing to remember is that uh, in our partnership with one of the provincial special prosecutors, uh, you know, if this case does end up in the criminal justice system, all your case notes and interactions with the youth would be subpoenaed. So it's a common tactic of defense lawyers to subpoena third party records to find inconsistencies in the victim's statements. So besides the fact that you're not investigators, right? Detectives and child protection workers are the ones that are trained and have these types of prof professional mandates to conduct investigations, but that's not really your job. What you can do is address immediate concerns and needs. So you might have to do a certain level of risk assessment with the initial disclosure, and it's okay to ask questions about what the youth needs and certainly address any concerns for physical safety. So currently we don't know of any tools that are really specific to addressing the risk of harm in cases of trafficking, uh, like ODERA, which is what victim services uses to assess morbidity risk in domestic or intimate partner violence. So youth could theoretically access victim services without pursuing charges against a perpetrator, but that referral would still need to go through the police in order to access those services. So really overpromising is also not a great idea. You know, if you say like, we're gonna get this guy, we're gonna make sure you get justice, everything's gonna be okay. It's, those things may not be true, right? So we're, we're getting there, but we're still lacking a coordinated and effective response to the problem here in Nova Scotia. And certainly the justice system is not designed to bring justice to the victim as an individual. We're developing a whole new module around the criminal justice system journey and what that looks like to educate service providers as well. And lastly, call and help. So gain the youth's consent to talk to other people. So it could be directly talking to police. Uh, if you're in Halifax Regional Municipality, the HRP uh, vice unit, talk to them directly. If there's a duty to report, or even if you're not sure, or if you have kind of hypotheticals that you wanna talk through with Department of Community Services, they're very open to that. And certainly you can give us a call. Uh, we have our frontline program, NSTAY, which stands for Nova Scotia Trafficking um, and Advocacy for Youth. Uh, sorry, transition and advocacy for youth, my bad, and stay. So you're certainly welcome to give us a call as well and just talk through the situation and whether it's appropriate to that we can provide support or if we can kind of connect you to, to other places. And um, Carol had a question around the consent around, uh, yes, uh, around can information be legally withheld? So if, the, if it's a child, there is the duty to report. Exactly. Yeah, and that's that's where those things come into play, you know, is, is around like, what are your own duties in terms of your role? And looking at the laws, what is what is your duty to report, etc. Um, Carol, when you're saying uh, getting consent to talk to others, is there someone in, in particular that you're thinking of? Sorry, I just had to unmute. No, I was just looking uh, along your slide where you say gain consent to talk to others. If we've, you know, if I'm in a position of being a teacher and, and a student um, shares this kind of information, uh, as I understand it, I can't not share it. Now, how I share it, I can, I can talk to the, the child about that, but I, I, as I understand it, I don't, I can't not tell somebody. Right, yeah. Yeah, in terms of your duty to report, absolutely. It does depend on the age of the child and if there is a familial exploitation happening. Uh, so that does depend on the, that might change the duty to report if they're over 16. But certainly if they're under 16, there is that duty to report. So you're right. It's not really about gaining consent to, to, do, to do your duty, right? But it could be more around explaining uh, the duty to report and talking them through the process, what the process might be. But even in terms of calling other folks, right? Like, okay, here's your duty to report to DCS, but what about calling YWCA? What if we, you know, call, call, let's call Thunder at YWCA and let's let's talk about what some options are, you know, respecting what the child or youth might want to do. But that may not even come into play because if there is that duty to report, um, let's say they're 13, right, then we're looking more at DCS involvement uh, and they have a whole separate process, right? And certainly they can be involved with us as well if they want, but there's there's very specific services and supports that are available through DCS if this does come up. So you're right, it's, it's not cut and dried like that. 
uh, you know, what I, in, in this case, I think if we're talking outside of the duty to report, you know, talking through it with them, um, if they're okay, talking to other folks and bringing other support in. But certainly we go into much more detail in our module three uh, when we talk about that. So I see someone has a question about how do we access the other modules. So I have your answer. I know we're right at 3.30, so I'll be quick. Uh, so here are just a couple of resources. Um, so first of all, I mentioned the, the Kids in the Know program. So I was in part of that presentation yesterday when this is with the Canadian Center for Child Protection. And I did want to bring it up and, uh, and I'm going to access that program and kind of look at it. So it's a personal safety program. It is available for all teachers. Uh, you can go online and there's training included and then resources to include in your classroom. Uh, so this is not a fear based program. Uh, it's really great. Even the little that I've seen of it, uh, it's it's fantastic and gives lots of uh, resources for kids in an age appropriate way around prevention. So not just this issue, but it does address sexual exploitation and trafficking, but also addresses in general child sexual abuse. In terms of intervention, you are welcome to give us a call. We are certainly not the only service provider that's working on this issue, but I'm from YWCA, so I do want to mention it, that we do have a frontline program uh, for youth age 13 to 24 who are um, have been exploited or trafficked or who might be at risk of it. And we do also have specific support for families and the kind of larger community as well. So even if a youth is not directly involved in our end state program, we have a family and community outreach worker that you're welcome to call and ask questions uh, and kind of walk through what, what options there are. And we recognize that there's very specific support that also needs to happen for parents and caregivers. In terms of aftercare and systems change, so we have our partnership uh, that we're convening, but it's very much a collaborative effort, the Trafficking and Exploitation Services System, so you can also reach out. Uh, we will have a service directory made available soon, which will be public, that will list all the various folks that are involved. We have some really great partners who are working on this issue across Nova Scotia. We're developing a system of response. We're working to change systems so that we do have an effective means to respond to this issue in Nova Scotia. And we just launched our new social media. Uh, so please give us a uh, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. And this is a way that you can stay current on the issue and on the provincial response. So lastly, these are my questions for you. So if I were to turn it over to you and say, so why do you think training matters? You've just spent two hours with me. I've given you a lot of information, nowhere near the amount of information that we do in our various modules. But why, why does training matter? And do you believe this is a problem in your school? And what are you going to do next? So quickly, just to answer the question that someone had around accessing these various training modules, all you have to do is send me an email and we'll get that set up. Uh, we can either offer it online. Uh, we, we've been doing virtual training since the pandemic, as well as coming this fall, we will open it up again to, to offer that in person. So if you want to host it at your school, if you want to host it in your community, in your region, all of our modules currently are really directed towards service providers and building capacity that way. So the ones we basically did module one today with a little bit of risk uh, factors kind of uh, thrown in there. We also have other modules around um, going deeper into risk and pathways to entry, best practices for service provision. We are developing and will be launching the next two in the fall. So the criminal justice system responses and supporting parents, guardians and families. So I know that we're coming to the end here. Uh, so if you did have some thoughts around that, uh, you know, in terms of why does training matter and what are you going to do about this, you can feel free to just kind of reflect on that or feel free, feel free to put it in the chat there if you have any other last thoughts. But I do just want to say thank you so much for spending the last uh, two hours with me and talking about this tough and complex issue. And you're welcome to reach out to me with questions, feedback, anything. My email is the Tess email. That's the easiest email to get a hold of me because my name is very, very long. So try that one and uh, I, I monitor that email daily.